organised by the Queensland Regional Committee of the AES. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Turrbal and the Yuggera people as the First Nations owners of the lands where we meet for those of us who are zooming in from Mianjin, Brisbane. Um, we recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, of research and of learning and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any other First Nations people joining us today, um, including anyone here who might be zooming in uh, from my home of Aotearoa, New Zealand. So welcome everyone. Um, yep, so my name is Rebecca. I'm on the AES Regional Committee. Um, I work for the YMCA of Brisbane um, as the Impact and Innovation Lead. So um, I really enjoy being on the committee. We've got a fantastic committee of people here in Queensland and I know that around Australia we have some great committees of the AES so I very much encourage um, people to join the AES if they're not a member already and I also very much encourage people to think about getting involved with their regional committee and um, if you are interested you can go to the AES website and um, find the contact details for your particular uh, state or territory. So um, I've just got a little bit of AES news that I will um, just have a little chat about before we get on to the presentation today. Um, so many of the people here today may have participated in the festival, which was held last month. Um, and we had a really great turnout to that. So thanks very much if you did come along. Um, we did circulate a SurveyMonkey link via email. So if you have received that, um, we really appreciate if you could um, just give us some feedback on your experience of festival. Um, via that survey. Um, I'd also like to remind people that we have invitations open to contribute to the AES blog and also EJA, which is the Evaluation Journal of Australasia. So um, yeah, they're looking for people who would like to write something about their festival experience or anything that the festival got you thinking about. Um, yeah, the working group would love to hear from you if you'd like to contribute to the blog and you can email the blog at blog at aes.asn.au for your festival story. Um, yeah, and you can also turn your ideas um, for a blog post into an article and the Evaluation Journal of Australasia would also love to hear from you or anyone else who's interested in making a contribution to the journal. Um, so do please get in touch with them as well. Um, now also we've got our AES annual report that's available on the AES website and anyone who has gone onto the website lately will have seen that the website has undergone a facelift and it looks really, really, really great. So if you haven't been to our new website, please get along to that as well. Um, and then lucky last, uh, I think today is the last day for people to register for um, a workshop which is Introduction to Program Logic presented by Rick Cummings. So no doubt you would have received some information about that by the email. So just a reminder, today's the last day to register for that. Okay, so on to housekeeping for today's session. Um, so yeah, well, everyone has popped on mute. Um, so make sure that you stay on mute unless you've actually got something um, that you want to say or want to ask a question. Um, and you can unmute yourself at any time if you wish. Now, the process for asking questions today, um, we'll have about 10 minutes of question time at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can either put your questions into the chat box as they come up in your mind, and at the end of the presentation, we'll um, select a few for the presenters to answer. Um, alternatively, what you can do is you can ask questions directly of the presenters at the end of the session when we invite questions. Uh, if you'd like to do that, you can actually raise your little virtual hand um, and if you've got a question and we will um, ask you to uh, direct that to the presenters. Um, so that icon can be found under the participants tab on the right hand side of your screen if you're not familiar with that. Okay, so um, the webinar, like Nicole said, is going to be recorded today, so please let her know if you've got any concerns about that. Alrighty, so on to our presentation and our lovely speakers. 
So we have today um, Charity Davies, who's standing in at the very last minute um, for Georgina Roberts, who's unwell. Uh, so Charity is an Associate Director with Grosvenor and has extensive experience in a wide range of organisational review and improvement disciplines, including leading large scale change and transformation projects. So welcome to Charity. And then we've also got Evie Cuthbertson. So Evie has nearly 20 years of experience consulting to the public sector. Um, Evie is a highly experienced and practical evaluator, which is always good to hear. Um, she has demonstrated ability to build strong rapport with clients and stakeholders and works to uplift capability in leading practice for monitoring and evaluation. So welcome Evie. Okay, so as you're all no doubt aware and very keen to listen, today's topic is are you evaluation ready? Improving the evaluation culture and capability of your team. So as we all know, evaluation is a unique skill set and way of thinking. To have an effective evaluative culture, it's important not only to focus on the skills of the individual evaluator, but also the capacity and readiness of the area or organisation as a whole. So in this session, we're going to listen to Evie and Charity. They'll be introducing us to the key features of evaluation culture, and by applying their evaluation maturity model, they will walk us through how to assess and enhance evaluation capability at both an individual and organisational level. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more and I will now hand over to Evie and Charity. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Nicole. And um, thank you everyone for coming today. And um, thank you uh, AES for putting on these um, events and giving us the opportunity to present today. Um, my name's Evie Cuthbertson. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to my colleague and co-presenter, Charity Davies, but I can't seem to see her on the screen at the moment. I don't know if that's a problem at my end, it often is. Um, no, Eve, I think I have to be speaking. So I think because you're sharing right. the screen at the moment, people will only see the, the, what, the person that's actually speaking. So hello everybody, I'm Charity Davies and um, you'll be hearing from me later in this presentation. Thanks hello. Charity. Um, yeah, so we'll look, sorry about that. We should, there, there's a, I'm, I'm, as I was saying before, I'm an MS Teams aficionado, but Zoom often gets the better of me, everybody. Um, but look, thank you again. Um, and Charity, yes, Charity and I work with Grosvenor. We're a professional services firm. And um, among, amongst other things, we undertake a lot of review and evaluation related work requirements with our clients, including those related to um, development of evaluation capability, both at the individual and, at the and, and also at the organisational level. And I guess um, to that extent, what are all the implications for that from a workforce capability perspective? And that's why we have Charity along today, because she has a particular um, sweet spot in that area. Um, so, we thought today, in terms of unpicking uh, what we mean by are you evaluation ready, it would be good to look at it in the context of um, organisational policy program or project and at the individual level, because the requirement or the uh, framework that you utilise to understand the degree of evaluation or the maturity of um, evaluation capability is same, same, but different according to which lens you are applying. And then rolling all of that together, what overall are the implications for the workforce capability, at the workforce capability level? So that's the uh, order of events uh, for today's discussion. I'm gonna be talking primarily around the organisational level uh, frameworks uh, and the uh, individual level maturity frameworks and Charity will be talking more uh, de in more detail relating to, you know, project, um, is my project program po um, policy evaluation ready? And then tying that all up nicely at the end with respect to workforce capability. Um, so first of all, let's talk about um, evaluation capability maturity through the organisational lens. But before we do that, we probably need to define what we mean by um, evaluation capability. 
and and I guess in all things related to evaluation, it's got about 50 different ways of describing that. Um, some people call this, um, you know, a performance culture, evidence-based practice, a results-oriented culture. But by way of our definition that we'll use today, we've gone back to um, John Main, and I'll just read it out so that we've got it at frontispiece of our mind. He's defined an evaluative culture as an organisational culture that deliberately seeks out information on its performance in order to use that information to learn how to better manage and deliver its programs and services and thereby improve its improve and thereby improve its performance. Now that's a bit of a mouthful uh, to drop into conversation at any at any one point, but I guess if you really boil it down to tin tacks, I see uh, an evaluative culture as an organisation that's clear on what performance it seeks out to achieve and what the um, requisite outcomes, uh, what requisite outcomes are needed, and then has a corresponding strong set of evidence and understanding of whether they are tracking towards achievement of those outcomes. And there's lots, I know that's a really kind of um, no frills edition of what um, an evaluation culture relates to, and we'll unpick it more over the next couple of um, slides. But I think it, it's, it, if, if you really get to the tin tacks of what John Mayne is saying there, it deliberately seeks out information. We know what we want to understand by way of performance, and we're going to use that information to improve how we do things around here and make it better. So that's really what we're um, talking about today. And what Charity and I want to share with you are the models, uh, maturity frameworks that we've developed along the way as part of our work with our clients and helping them to achieve um, their different project requirements that have supported them to um, better understand where their organisation sits um, according to the different domains, um, different capability domains. Um, because if I move now to the next slide, you can see that there's lots of different, when you actually start to unpick what an evaluative culture looks like or evaluation readiness looks like, there's lots of different um, related domains. For example, I'm sure all of you out there in Zoom land have um, been exposed to organisations that do evaluation really well or aspects of, really, of evaluation really well. And when they're doing that, you sort of see these kinds of features or these kinds of signs. Um, I won't go through all of them now for the benefit of time, but let's just unpick a few. Um, in a, in a, um, in a high-performing high organisation, you'll see continuous learning and improvement is normal practice. And I guess um, from my experience, those are the organisations where learning and sharing of information is valued. Um, there are regular learning events. Um, people, are, 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 um, uh, people are not afraid to share mistakes in that, um, you know, well, as in like, they're not happy about finding out about the mistakes, but people are pleased that when these mistakes are brought out into the light, that they can then learn from them and then respond to them and make things better. Um, those are the organisations that have got really good um, uh, systems and supporting processes that enable you to collect good data that then supports that empirical evidence that can then um, help you understand what's happening by way of your program or your policies, performance, et cetera. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would observe um, um, by way of a high performing uh, organisation is those are the organisations where evaluations just, you know, the way we do things around here. Um, there's a constant, um, I suppose, culture or um, environment where you're questioning things, you're using evidence to push things forward, um, you're, you're, you're constantly um, reviewing where you uh, want to get to and where you sit along that race mark. Again, I won't um, uh, go through these all verbatim because you can all access the slides later. But I guess um, sometimes you can see these different features 
in, in evidence. But then I guess when you look across the, the map, if we're up in our helicopter looking down on these key features of success, sometimes you'll observe in an organisation that there are gaps or deficits. And the models and frameworks we've developed are a way or a um, structured approach that you can use to identify um, where you're going well with respect to your evaluation capability and then where there is room for improvement. And that's what I'll just, I'll, and these are the models that I'll, I'll take you through now, how, how, they were how they were derived and how they were applied. And just by way of like context before I move into the, the maturity, the evaluation capability and maturity models we've developed, um, I guess by way of a definition of what a, a maturity model is, I'm um, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to teach you all the suck eggs, but um, we, we all uh, call things by different names. Um, a model is often referred to as a framework and it is a structured approach that enables you to assess um, either at the organisation or the individual level where you are at a certain point in time by way of a capability against a particular domain. And um, that then serves as the jumping off point for where you want to address um, or, or action improvements or um, um, where you want to head next. The model I'll take you through on the next slide, it's probably um, important that I um, just go back a step to explain how we designed it, just so that you know it wasn't something we just pulled out of um, our head, it was evidence-based. And I'm sure a lot of you have already come across a range of capability frameworks, either um, in your workplace or it, your, your department probably has one, for example, or alternatively, uh, it's driven by uh, outcomes-based reporting and um, legislative requirements, for example. But um, in um, developing this model, we reviewed a range of existing frameworks and from that generated 10 uh, capabil evaluation capability domains. And as part of that, we um, then developed the descriptors, which would um, enable you to peg where you sat on each particular domain according to maturity levels of um, beginning, developing, embedded, and leading. So if you can imagine, it's like you know your x axis is your um, domains, and your y axis is the maturity levels. Um, and then to undertake the assessment, we developed corresponding um, interview uh, guides, documentation guides, and then tested and refined the model. So that's essentially how we derived it, how we ended up with this model, and then how we apply it in, in the practical coalface of, of working with our clients. So I know this is a very busy slide, and I won't break down each of the domains um, uh, in sequence. Suffice, we ended up with 10 domains. Um, and you can see they sort, if you move around the wheel in a clockwise um, um, uh, direction, they relate to sort of uh, um, four core groupings, if you like. The, the culture, the leadership, the governance, the collaboration, engagement, and the people. They're all sort of, you know, the, the um, uh, both a combination of soft and hard enablers, but people and um, uh, decision-making related. Then you have the system uh, domain, and that's around um, how do our systems tie together to support the delivery of program evaluation? Are we collecting the right data? Can the different data sets talk to each other? Are they consistent? Can we aggregate them? Can we um, derive insight, bigger and better insights by um, um, using different data sets, et cetera? Then you have the group, uh, the orange, pink and uh, purple group, uh, sorry, the, the Movi group relating to the nuts and bolts of planning conducting and using um, the actual evaluation um, data, information and recommendations derived. And then the last um, domain is actually focused on evaluation capability itself. How, um, you know, how are we performing um, the program evaluation in and of itself? 
So um, that's essentially the, the breakdown of the maturity model. And um, we apply this, you know, in, um, in situations with our clients where they, where they want to look at things from an organisational perspective. It might be in relation to seeing how well how we've, we've um, uh, worked with clients, for example, that de developed an evaluation strategy, a three year strategy at the 18 month mark. They wanted to understand how they were travelling with respect to delivery of that strategy strategy and whether they were actually gaining any traction according to these different domains. So in that instance, we were able to have a baseline, you know, with the, with, at the starting point, uh, and then we were able to see how far they'd gone within an 18 month timeframe and able to recalibrate where they needed to address their um, strategies and, and planning for the, for the future um, 18 months of the strategy. Again, I sort of briefly explained how we apply the framework in, um, uh, you know, the project, the organisation context. But basically, from those domains, we derived a range of, um, you know, data collection tools, undertook a range of um, interviews and documentation review, pulled the evidence together, determined the ratings using those um, broad brush, uh, you know, beginning, developing, going well, uh, and then identified where the areas for improvement lay moving forward um, and then helped the clients to prioritise which of those opportunities or recommendations were a priority and um, help them to plan that out. Um, there's a, a link here I've, and, I've, and I've put, by the way, sorry everybody, I've put the links in the chat if you do want to access any of these um, uh, other details. This is an article we developed uh, relating to driving, uh, about driving evaluation uh, capability, a driving evaluation readiness in your organisation. And that explains a little bit more um, uh, of, of the application of, of this particular model, if you do want to explore that further. Just a few tips and traps before I wrap up. Um, one of the things we've learned along the way is that it's really important when you're undertaking this kind of maturity assessment um, that you're clear about what level you actually want to aspire to. For example, it's just not practical for each and every organisation to want to be, or to be able to be leading across all 10 capability domains. Um, well, I mean, I'm sure some organisations can and do achieve that, but often um, an, an organisation may not necessarily have the capacity or the resourcing to enable that. So it's really important to um, pick your battles and as part of that prioritisation step that I talked about on the last slide, that's when you want to come up with what capabilities are really going to get me ma ma get, enable me to attain the most impact moving forward. Um, I guess the other tip that we've, I would, I would um, put out there is that um, um, when you start to talk about evaluation capability, people can often get caught up in quite a, um, you know, on, on, that, on that train track and it, it relates to key concepts, terminology um, and what opportunities um, uh, you need to take up. And I would recommend thinking flexibly uh, in this, in this uh, when you're out there in this, um, at, when you're out there trying to move things forward. There's lots of um, really creative ways you can um, piggyback on existing projects and, and um, uh, other um, kind of um, opportunities that can carry your capability uh, forward. But it's, or, but, but you don't necessarily have to call it evaluation capability per se. It doesn't need to be wrapped up in that nice evaluation capability wrapping paper. Um, the other thing I would recommend is when you've undertaken a, an assessment like this, if you come up with a laundry list of recommendations, it's really important to prioritise because if you've got 10 key things that you're supposed to achieve before Christmas, often people get, they're like rabbits in the headlights and everybody, and the whole thing falls over and your project loses credibility and nothing gets done. So my recommendation would be choose one or two things where you think you're going to be able um, to, to, to um, gain the best traction and just do those things well. And, you know, ipso facto, once you start to move things along, all of a sudden you start to, you've started to build up momentum and you can manage the rest of the recommendations in year two, et cetera. Um, 
I think that's probably my two or three key tips there. Um, and I guess really um, that would be, that wraps, that sort of wraps up um, our summary of what we've done uh, by way of understanding evaluation readiness and using these frameworks to support that kind of assessment. But if we think back to when we started, we were looking at things through three lenses organisation, the project and the program or the policy level, and then the individual level. So I'm just going to hand over to Charity now to talk through the different kinds of frameworks or checklists that you can use when you want to understand capability um, with respect to the pro at, at the program level. Thanks, Charity. Thanks, Eve. That's a great start. I think that's a really nice way of um, prefacing this, having that the layers, organisation, program, project layer, individual layer, and what that means from a workforce, workforce point of view is really important. So um, moving from that org layer to, um, you know, a project, program, um, policy layer, often um, when you're looking at your policy program or project, you're going to be looking at it in a much narrower lens. So you're going to go narrower and deeper and that requires a differently oriented tool to what we're looking at at the org layer. So um, let's have a look at um, the, the slide that you can see in front of you now is um, we, we have a, a downloadable checklist which is designed to help you navigate your way through planning your evaluation for your policy or your program or your um, project. And the checklist summarises and organises the steps and various aspects that should be considered when you're establishing a sound and structured evaluation plan. So the actions and considerations suggested in the checklist are structured around the four basic questions you can see on the screen in front of you. So first of all, what is it that we're doing in this program project or um, policy? How will we um, use the information that comes out of the evaluation? What's the intended purposes of um, doing the evaluation? So, which leads to the why. Why are we conducting it? And more importantly, why are we conducting it now? How are we planning on doing that? So is this something we're going to do internally or are we going to seek some assistance from um, external, from other agencies or from private providers to help us with this? And then a question around um, what resourcing is required to get this done in a way where we're able to um, pursue the right type of evaluation methodology, get the right um, information, the right data, do the right consultation so that we're collecting and analysing information that's going to achieve the purposes um, that, that we're, we intended with the evaluation in the beginning, um, but also identifying at this point what the time and resourcing constraints might be um, with regard to being able to get that information um, in a usable way. And then finally, when. So when are we going to um, undertake the evaluation activities? When are we looking for um, data packs? When are we doing consultations? Um, what's the timing of key milestones and deliverables? So following that um, general sequence of tasks outlined um, in the checklist, um, will ensure that amongst other things, you're identifying what key decisions will need to be made throughout the evaluation um, and when they'll need to be made, um, that appropriate resources are allocated, that the evaluation is proportional to the program that you're evaluating. So um, I think we've all seen um, great examples of where there's been fantastic overkill in program or policy evaluations where the cost of the evaluations probably outweighed any risk associated with the program going wrong but also the opposite happens right where where um, evaluation might be planned in, a, in too light a fashion or the evaluation methodology is not necessarily fit for purpose um, so following this approach means and following the checklist will mean that there is um, proportional and effort associated 
um, with the evaluation. It'll ensure that sufficient support um, is provided, most importantly from leadership, so from management, from key stakeholders, that the right touch points are in place to ensure the right um, level of information is provided at the right times and that it's um, generated in an effective way so that it can be used effectively um, for the purposes intended and also so that um, through every cycle, so through every evaluation on every policy, every program, every project, we're embedding and reinforcing that evaluation culture. It's fostered and encouraged at every turn. And I just, something you said before, Eve, um, which sort of twigged something in my mind is about, you know, that domain around culture, what we see and, and why this part is so important is if you set out in your plan to use your evaluation as a stick for policing people and for um, identifying um, major weaknesses and, and gaps, then that's the culture that you'll embed along the way. If, however, you use your evaluation as an opportunity for capability building, for um, instituting a growth mindset within the organisation, um, and linking that to the strategic objectives of the organisation at every turn, then each time you do an evaluation at that policy program or project level, you are reinforcing that positive evaluative culture along the way. Um, thanks, Eve. If, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. So what, what you'll see here is, um, have I lost you? No, I can see you, Charity. Okay, sorry, I just lost things on my screen. My, my yes. There we go. Um, so what you'll see on, on this slide is just a, a, an extract or a snapshot of our um, checklist. The checklist is broken down into the two key columns, um, provides tasks on one side, as well as a brief supporting explanation on the right hand side. So I'll post this link into the chat now so that uh, you've yes. Oh, yes, and actually Charity, that's, that's if um, people do want to uh, go to that article, it's uh, I've posted it up the very top of the, um, of the chat, in the chat uh, cycle, hopefully. Fantastic, thanks Eve. So um, that's all for policy program and um, project layer. Eve, I'll hand back to you for individual layer. Thanks, Charity. Um, this is the final uh, piece, I uh, the final lens uh, that we wanted to walk you through today in terms of uh, unpicking evaluation capability at the individual level. So I guess it's sort of from the lens of, well, hey, how am I going? as an evaluator, where, you know, what, what areas um, do I, am, am I um, showing signs of success in or where, where are my deficiencies? And um, from, I, I don't know if anyone out there um, on, the, um, on the participant list has, uh, was, was put in the um, recent Transeval uh, series, there was actually a, ses a session on the AES evaluators um, uh, learn, uh, capability tool um, and it was derived from the uh, the learning competency framework which I'm sure all of you AES members would be very familiar with um, but the domains relating to attitude professional practice uh, skill inter interpersonal skills etc but um, I guess um, the evaluation specific tool that I've just referred to, um, I've, been, I've been back in touch with the AES to see where uh, that's up to in its evolution and life cycle. It's currently being, up, I'm, I'm sorry I can't provide you the link at the moment, but it's currently being updated by the AES and um, an actual self-assessment tool is currently being developed. So um, I don't really have um, anything more to share from that point of view. Suffice though, uh, that we'll, my understanding is that that will be accessible on the website soon once it's um, been completed. And, um, you, you know, ahead of, um, you know, guessing ahead of its finalisation, I imagine it's going to be something like um, the other frame, you know, the, the different um, ratings, if you will, across these different domains. So, um, 
as evaluators, I think this is also a really interesting assessment exercise for us to undertake uh, to keep us honest and up to speed in terms of our own professional development and, um, uh, you know, in terms of planning where we need to um, um, pick up our skills and improve um, according to the competency domains. Um, Look, so that's really, um, and, and um, I'm sorry I can't share the tool with you today, but um, suffice, where does that leave us um, with respect to workforce capability? And we did want to close um, uh, on that, looking at evaluation capabil capability within the context of the overall workforce framework. Um, because if you haven't got that closing loop, then you're really um, not looking at evaluation capability or evaluation readiness um, in context. And so I wanted to hand back to Charity now to close us out, to, to talk us, to step us through just that. Thanks, Eve. So, so look, rather than being evaluation specific, workforce capability frameworks are designed to be applied to all of the functions that are undertaken within your organisation. So the slide you can see now um, really is just a, a very short and snappy construct for um, looking at how we typically build up a workforce capability matrix or model or framework, noting that those um, terms are used interchangeably depending on the vernacular of the organisation. So typically a workforce capability model is made up of, at the very top, enterprise um, capability sets. And what I mean by that is, these are those capability sets that are required for your organisation to achieve its strategic objective. So it might be things like financial, people management, policy design, service delivery, high level, enterprise level capabilities that are required by your organisation for it to achieve its, its strategic objectives. That's typically um, the pointy end or the top end of um, any workforce capability model. Now, it, it would be remiss in my view, um, without taking too much of a purist stance on this, for organisations, particularly in thinking about how we become future ready, how we pre prepare um, for the future of work and, and start building a um, workforce for the future, to not be thinking in that enterprise capability set space about where evaluation fits in. So it might be, um, there's lots of, lots of ways to do this, right? There's no, no one right way, but it might be that an organisation in their enterprise capability sets at that very top level have something like a, a research and evidence um, enterprise capability, or it might be an audit and evaluation capability. There's lots of different ways to cut it, but through the design um, of workforce capability models or frameworks, um, we should be thinking about where evaluation fits in. The next layer down um, then is each enterprise level set includes the capabilities at a functional level that are required to achieve that enterprise purpose. So for example, if an enterprise capability set was say people management, the individual functional capabilities that might be included in that set might include things like recruitment, development plans, performance management, workforce planning, etc. Or if an enterprise set was something like communications, then the capabilities, the functional capabilities that sit within that set might include digital comms, social media management, internal communications, editing and publishing, etc. You get the drift. So, so we go from that enterprise high level, what's needed for the organisation to achieve its remit, down to what does that look like when we connect it to the functions of what we actually undertake within the organisation. Usually each capability within a set is described based on the high level elements that are involved in undertaking that capability. So let's look at evaluation. Imagine there's an enterprise um, capability set that is, um, say, research and evidence. 
And then evaluation is a capability, a functional capability that sits within that enterprise level set. That evaluation capability would typically be described using half a dozen or eight high level elements. So if you think back to what um, Evie had in those 10 domains and what we know is in the, um, the AES capability framework, it might include things like understanding evaluation theory and its application within the organization's context, um, identifying appropriate evaluation methods, planning and undertaking research or inquiry, developing key result areas or measures, planning and undertaking detailed consultations or inquiries, um, analysing large data sets. Um, it might include something in there about um, detailed consultation or um, evaluative uh, attitude and professional practice. So that's how a functional level capability is described using a series of elements that talk about how that capability is applied in practice. But then what does that mean in terms of our workforce and how do we measure our maturity in undertaking that capability? Well, typically um, the way we do that is to build proficiency descriptors, which are used to describe the increasing skill level associated with each capability. And you can actually marry that up with the increasing maturity level at the, at the organisation level around capability. So usually what we choose to do in that proficiency space or what we encourage um, organisations to do is to build proficiency layers that might start at sort of the emerging level right through to the expert level where um, you have an individual able to, to assess or even a team able to assess on that, um, uh, in that capability what proficiency level they're sitting at. Clever organisations go ahead and map capabilities and proficiency levels to roles. So they say, if uh, Evie, you're, um, you're in role X, and here are the capabilities that are mapped to your role in order for you to be able to undertake that role um, at the level required. Here are the capabilities that are mapped to that role. And here are the proficiency levels from emerging through to expert that are related to each of those capabilities mapped to your role. And oftentimes, particularly in the public sector construct, we see that that lines up nicely with um, the classification structure. So there's a way of blending that in with the classification structure. Um, what does that mean at the individual level then? So at the individual level, the benefit of doing that is you're in a situation where um, the workforce can be baselined against those capabilities and proficiency uh, levels that are mapped to their roles, um, to the roles that they currently occupy. But um, another, another nice um, thing about it is it, individuals can baseline themselves against um, capabilities and, uh, that are not matched to their roles, that, are, that they feel they have some um, proficiency level in, which might come from a previous role they've held or from some particular subject matter expertise they've picked up through um, training or development or qualifications, etc. The way that that, um, there's lots of ways to baseline the workforce against that, that kind of um, construct, um, including coming up with assessment questions. Um, uh, for each proficiency level so that you can validate and verify where an individual sits on that um, increasing skill scale, if you like. Um, but, you know, I, I guess, it, as I said before, this is a broader construct for capabilities across an organisation, across all functions that exist in an organisation. Typically, we see that there are a core set of capabilities that are mapped to all roles in the organisation and then there are specific capabilities that are mapped to only some roles. Evaluation may be one of those um, uh, specialist capabilities that are only mapped to some roles in the organisation um, and you know this is in by no means are we saying you need to go ahead and develop a workforce capability matrix that covers everything you do in the organisation. Like Evie was saying before you can do this type of thing in bite-sized chunks so there is absolutely nothing stopping you starting with um, 
a with the evaluation capability so thinking about what fits with evaluation at the enterprise level what would the enterprise level set look like and then how would we describe the evaluation function vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, the domains and what's in the AES capability framework um, how do we describe those key elements and then what would an increasing scale of skill or proficiency look like from emerging through to expert within that um, capability. So um, that's really just a, a high level construct for how we build um, capability frameworks. And that's how we would um, advocate that um, evaluation capability from the individual levels also built. Uh, next slide for me, please, Eve. Thank you. So this slide really is just to say the best examples of capability models that we've built and been involved in um, sit at the centre of all workforce and capability management practices and they actually form the fulcrum around which the rest of the people management ecosystem operates. So you can see up the top there are a range of um, factors their future of work structure um, and you know org design job and skills design career pathways um, your capability model should be informed by those but those items should also be informed by your capability model once you have it in place so your capability model should be helping drive your structure um, because you know done properly you will have a very very clear view of where your um, enterprise level capability gaps are at team level, at individual development plan level, um, so it can inform career pathways, it can inform job design and org design. Um, it's also then becomes a very useful data set to be used for succession and talent management and for the ability to stand up teams quickly and for mobility, for standing up tiger teams or cross-functional teams, for multidisciplinary teams, etc for individuals to take an active development mindset in their own um, career development and progression, et cetera. So to drive that culture um, and link um, active development mindsets into uh, everyday thinking within the organisation. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Terry. That's excellent. Um, I, um, I really appreciate you walking us through that. And um, <laughs> I've got some other links. I'll post those to the to the chat in a second, um, uh, which, which um, takes you through to further articles um, if you're interested in, in um, uh, expanding on some of these slides a little bit more that Charity's just walked us through. Thank but you. there's one more slide yeah. there, which oh, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry. Beg your pardon. No, sorry, everybody. Fine. No, no, that's okay. I think it just ties it together nicely, not just in terms of the workforce capability model but everything we've talked about today uh, around you know that evaluative uh, culture and practice the communications that go along with that how you affect um, good change management in a shift to a good uh, evaluative culture and that is to start with the value propositions that this brings for your organisation. So, you know, in building capability models, we always ask ourselves the question of, well, what's in it for the individual? What's in it at the team level? And what's in it for the organisation? And I guess the big takeaway here for us is at the individual level, it really is that um, empowerment or ownership to have that visibility about how, um, you know, I can see what the increasing proficiency or skill levels are now in this evaluation capability or in the um, suite of capabilities associated with evaluation. And I feel empowered to be able to improve my um, skill set and proficiency level in this space. So it is driving that active development um, culture as opposed to performance management um, uh, hardwired or hard you know default to weaknesses and gaps um, kind of culture it's a different it's a shift in mindset at the team level it really is about 
that ability to be much more flexible with your workforce, with your workload allocation, with your um, shifting work to where the capability is and where the strengths are, and being able to be very agile in how you construct teams and bring people together um, to get the work done quickly. And then at the org level, the big takeaway um, that we get over and over when we look at the outcomes from building capability frameworks is around that ability to do true strategic workforce planning that's over the horizon, that's future ready. It's, it's looking at what skills do we need to enable our workforce to have and then at the enterprise level what um, capabilities do we need to really harden up to be um, a going concern in five and ten years time so I just think that's a nice slide that pulls all of that together Eve but that's it now I promise I'll, I'll stop talking. No, I'm sorry that was <laughs> that was the kicker and I'm sorry I I uh, cut you off with uh, more talk about some other great articles that you've written uh, in relation to this that I'll post into the chat in a sec. Thanks, Um, But look, really, um, thank you all. I guess that concludes um, Charity and my session today. Um, uh, so we've really enjoyed it. Thank you again for having us. And um, Rebecca, I, I, I think we've got 10 minutes now for any questions or further discussion. So I'll, I'll hand over to you now to, to facilitate. Thanks, Evie, and thank you, Charity. Um, that was really great. And I actually had a question percolating around in my brain um, that Charity ended up uh, answering, which was fantastic, um, which is about and how do you um, work to have people understand how that evaluation can be part of their role, even if it's not a core part of their role. And I thought the talk about the workforce capability was really helpful. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so we do have a question. I invite people to put questions in the chat. And if they have questions, um, please also even put your hand up with the little raise your hand function. So we'll start with the question that um, P Main has put here. Um, so asking, how would you suggest going about trying to change the culture of an organization where senior management do not want to be evaluated unless the result makes them look good? Yeah. That I, would you like me to answer that one, Charity, or...? or, or yeah, absolutely, Ed, go for it. Oh, that is the hard... I think that probably is one of the hardest, um, almost difficult challenges to overcome. Uh, and um, it, it knocks off a lot of good um, evaluators and a lot of... Uh, and, and I think that probably some of my biggest disappointments have been great evaluation reports, great recommendations that have ended up in the bottom drawer because um, of, the, of the lack of wanting, only wanting to um, uh, see what's good and to not learn from mistakes. Um, I think probably um, where I have seen that turn around have been, um, well, in, in a range of instances, one, um, it, 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 you know, Charity um, was talking before about, um, uh, you know, it's that shift, that schism between identifying your gaps or identifying your deficits to opportunities, to harnessing your strengths and to, um, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the flip of the coin, it's, it's the second side of the coin, if you will. And um, uh, an example I, I experienced once was that we had a really tough evaluation. Results were really damning and um, not only put the whole um, program in, into, a, into, a, 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 into, a, into a corner, but the, org the organisation. And um, what was really interesting was it was almost um, the change was driven by not necessarily the people that were the decision makers. It was by the people that were actually at the coalface of the program delivery that were passionate about making it work and making it work better. And their reframe was, thank God you brought this into the light. Thank God um, um, we've learned this now before there's a, before, you know, before the train actually tilts right off the tracks and takes more lives with it. Thank God we found this now. And, um, and hey, good on you, leadership. Thank God you are creating this environment where you are now in control of bringing this train back on the tracks and steering it back safely into the station. So uh, that makes me feel that we were all very manipulative and complicit in um, that reframe. But I, I found that um, 
even though the, 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 people, the, the people that actually took charge of that situation weren't necessarily the decision makers and they weren't necessarily empowered from a um, delegation point of view, from a, um, 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 I suppose, a, a grassroots um, level, they really made a huge change in, in turning um, that mindset around. The other thing that I would say that I've, I've seen in terms of turnarounds um, peep, uh, is um, finding champions. And um, if you can find one or two champions in, in the field, um, if you have identified through your um, maturity assessment model that this is a problem in leadership, if you can bring those champions into the fold to extol the virtues of evaluation and to, um, I suppose, um, uh, uh, what's the word, be a flagship in terms of how using um, difficult results to improve things has actually been a win-win for everybody. I think um, I've, I've also observed that on a number of occasions. The other thing is the assessment or the maturity um, uh, assessment in and of itself can actually bring that to light. For example, if you've um, assessed, you, you've, had an in, you've had an independent assessment which says, hey, um, you know, you've got all the skills, great, you're a leader, hey, um, data's fantastic, leadership, bow, bow, you're a bunch of duds. Having that, in a, having that documented and um, um, it can be quite confronting, but you've got that, um, it, it sort of highlights it and it can be, um, and because it's um, based on a robust methodology, uh, it, it, it can't be contested and it's not, it's not subjective through the use of this model. So those are three examples where I've seen it turn around, but I'm not saying for a minute that it, um, in any of those situations, was it easy um, or um, was it, um, it, it was stressful. Does, does that answer, I just would be interested, Rebecca, if you could ask the, um, the, the, the participant whether that answers her question sufficiently. Does that answer <laughs> does that answer these questions especially? <laughs> um, yes, thank you. That was very helpful. So that's awesome. Um, okay, so I've got another question here. It's great that I can um, choose the questions because this is something that's been in my mind a, a lot lately. Um, do you see a link between building evaluation capability and building monitoring and data capability in an organisation? Yes. Uh, do you want me to take that one, Evie? Yes, yes. That'd be great, Charity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's no uh, doubt about that. And when you, you think about um, any capability model, um, whether it's a, a whole of workforce or whether it's just in that um, enterprise set related to evaluation, you'll see that there's quite a bit of crossover. So the trick in um, building up your capability model is to make sure that there are linkages and their sequence and interaction between the capabilities but not overlap um, mm. because you want people um, or you want your workforce um, building capability um, without being measured twice for the one capability or the one one um, task or skill level if that makes sense yeah and, and often I would say too with that charity, um, depending on how the organisation is structured, that can also cause the, um, uh, the de-linking, if that makes sense. For example, if you've got uh, like, um, you might, it could be one or two things, like normally what you'd want is this, you know, both your data management, data generation analysis is bubbling along, streaming along nicely over here, and then your evaluation capabilities also uh, you know, syncopated, and for whatever reason, uh, be, because of structural um, issues, and and because so and so, this this part of the schism isn't talking to that part of the organisation, that can also derail things. But yes, I agree with you, Charity. They're totally interlinked, and um, you can't optimise things if both aren't working um, in unison and 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 to um, to a high standard. Yeah, and look, I think one thing that I'd point out here is we have a vast library of capability and proficiency descriptors so that, and, you know, teasing out how they, how they sequence together but don't overlap, there's a bit of a sum of that, mm. but we do have a vast um, library of those descriptors. So if you're looking for a bit of a, a read on how to do that, just thing out and we can give you some um, guidance over email for that kind of thing. 
Rebecca, I noticed there's a, a question in there around um, behavioural frameworks to drive change. And I was just yep. wondering if I could quickly say, one of the things that's really important in building up capability is looking at the aptitudes that go along with that. And so related to behaviours, but probably at a more um, an easier assessment um, level is looking at the aptitudes that go along with good evaluative practice. And so oftentimes we will work with organisations to build up an aptitudes framework that sits alongside the capability framework. So there are um, ways of doing it. There are particular um, behavioural aptitudes that relate to change. Thanks so much for that, Charity. Um, so look, we've got a couple, a few questions in here, but I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, just keeping in mind some people's lunch times. Um, so thank you to everyone for submitting a question. Um, and sorry if we haven't been able to get to it. Um, so look, I'd like to, two things. I'd very much like to thank Charity and Evie for their time. Um, I'd also um, welcome people to stick around for just one or two minutes because we do have um, a quick poll, which is what we use to evaluate these sessions. But yeah, so I really thank you so much, um, Evie and Charity. I know I certainly took a lot out of that and I'll be pouring back over your slides again and sending you an email to say, can I have some more information on that as well? So um, thanks Evie and Charity, and I'm sure thank you um, on behalf of everyone here um, as well. And participants, please stay on the line for another 